Hi, everyone. Ahmed, that was kick-ass. That was a great way to start um, this summit. Well, uh, my talk is called Building a Creative Culture Through Magical Tools. But if I'm being honest with you, that's kind of just a fluffy title. The title of the talk should be more like this. It's how a creative culture becomes UX-oriented game dev with a lot of magical tools. Because this is a story. This is a story about how this happened at Space Ape, where I work over the past couple of years. And looking at how things happened is a learning experience, and it might you know, inspire someone to go off and do something similar. Um, because the ultimate benefit of this kind of culture is saving time. And tools take you a super long way there. Because you know, we all know that time saved on implementation means more time for research and design. But OK, before we dig in, let me introduce myself properly. I'm, hi, I'm Lisa. I'm Brazilian, which means that I can be at the same time relentlessly optimistic, but also constantly depressed about politics and the environment. But I've always loved video games, so I guess that's a positive thing. My entire career has been in video games. I started with a BA in graphic design. I jumped straight into an internship in game design. I was poached to do some UI for PC. And eventually, I fell in love with mobile UI. And that's where I have been for the past four years at Space Ape Games. Um, yeah, Space Ape Games, we do mobile games, free-to-play mobile games. You might have heard of a few of them. I worked. In a lot of I did a lot of fe UI feature work for Transformers Earth Wars with Hasbro. I was also the lead UI designer for Go Race Super Karts, which was unfortunately canceled, but I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about that later. And I'm currently the UI lead and the only UI designer um, on a secret unannounced project. That's super awesome. But at Space Ape, I'm mostly known for being that UI person who shouts about milkshake and share tech and flow stuff a lot. I promise, this is all going to make sense very soon. So we were here. We were talking about why this is super true, and this is super important, and how I believe that the way that we can achieve this is through a UX-oriented game dev. So I guess what I'm going to talk about is the UX of game development itself, um, more than just UX for the game. So a UX-oriented game dev culture fosters that this kind of behavior, but what the hell does that even mean? Well, it's pretty much everything that we, if you, you know, if you're a UX uh, designer or UI designer, you're a researcher, you know this very intimately, but let's just summarize this, right? We know that UX is everyone's responsibility. We need to uphold that value. This means that game design, you know, developers, audio designers, producers, all of them are responsible and deeply understand that UX is their value and not just the UI guy responsibility. And also means that we are humble students of the genres that we are working on. So we play the games, but not only we play them, we analyze them, and we, want, we understand what makes them good. The next part is an open channel of communication between developers and, de and designers. And this means no us versus them mentality. That's like the worst thing that possibly can happen. And just behaving like one huge team instead of two separate independent teams. Finally, and this is the main subject of my talk, is about empowering teams with magical tools. Um, this saves a lot of time and basically means listening to what the dev team has to say and getting to good results fast. Let me exemplify by talking about a bit of a default UI development process so you can see what I mean. Let's say that you get, you're a UI designer and you get like a new feature, a new spec from a game designer or, or pr producer or manager. And it has some UX requirements. You go off, you do your research, do your homework, do some wireframes, work on some visual design, prototype some stuff, maybe play test it at that level. And then, hey, look, you know, you have a new animation challenge that you need to tackle. Maybe you don't know how to do this in the engine just yet. So you go off, you pre-visit, let's say, in After Effects or something, or whatever software you use, and you show it to your developer and you go, hey, do you think you can do this? Because like, I don't know how to do this just right now. So then you have a conversation about your potential solutions for this. Let's say that, like I do, you work in Unity. And so you look, OK, maybe we can do like a custom animation in the Unity um, animation pane, which, as much as I love it, is a world of pain in itself. Uh, maybe you need to hook it up in Mechanim. Or maybe we need to do a super bespoke custom code-driven solution that, as a UI designer, I might not have access to. 
So you talk about it, cool. You decide to write a custom script for that thing. It's a Unity script. That's awesome. They go off, make a build. In my case, it's for mobile, so you need uh, to, to test it on the device. So you do that, and maybe it's not exactly how you want it to be, so you have to do like a review process, and you go back to deciding, hey, can we do this? Can we change it? Should we change the solution? Whatever, and then you do the review until everyone's satisfied with it, and you go back to getting a ne the next feature, right? That's very usual. I'm pretty sure if you work with games, this is pretty much the same process that everyone does. So that's cool, but if you work in a company like I do, where there's multiple projects happening at the same time, each project will end up with a bunch of different solutions. Sometimes these solutions will be very bespoke to their own project for various reasons. And we're all super busy. Sometimes there's little, little communication happening between the teams. And you don't really realize that those solutions might be for the same problem. And you only find out after everyone's already done their own thing. And you're kind of frustrated thinking, hey, you know what? I could have done that. Like, I could have swiped that. So I'll give you an example and tell you the story about how we did it at Space Safe. Because we listened to each other and we got tired of solving the same problem three times, we organized that whole mess into a suite of solutions that can be used by all projects. They live in a single repository. They're kept updated by everyone. And they tackle a variety of UI-specific problems. I'm going to talk about UI even though there's a bunch of other branches for this. Some are specific to 3D rendering. You know, Some of them are specific to certain types of component um, and features. So this is I'm going to talk about the UI because that's my area. So some of the problems that they tackle are like UI-specific animation, or they make improvements to UI performance, which is hella important because we work on mobile. Uh, some of them are built to you know, produce minimal designer dev handoff, or sometimes no handoff whatsoever. And also to give us a wider variety of performant UI visual effects, because you know, we need that. So I'm going to just show you a quick video of some of these tools so you can see what I mean. And then I'm going to tell you the story about how that happened. This one has audio, if you can turn it up. Thanks. It's a whole bunch of stuff. How the fuck did that happen? OK, I'm going to tell you a quick, quick story. Um, and these are the things that I believe, well, we as a company kind of discussed it. Like, OK, how did we make this happen? Because this, this is a big part of what we do now, but it did happen over the last couple of years. So it's relatively new, you know? And I think it's because of the combination of having the right people uh, with a kick-ass starting motivation sharing as a big part of the culture of the company and using the correct results as momentum. So, right, let's start with the right people. What this means is when you have a combination of hiring 
Creative engineers who really care about UX and don't think this is someone else's responsibility, this is also theirs. And then you mix them up with tech-savvy UI designers who like understand implementation on a deep level. You have a clear path of communication and empathy be between them. And they become one team instead of you know, people handing things off to each other and l letting them do the work. So how this happened, this interesting combination, um, I'm going to share a little genealogy tree of this family of tools. So Adam, who's here, by the way, um, he's a UI designer. He wanted to tackle the problem of having a better way of doing animation for UI that did not use the default um, engine animation pane, right? So he created this little spec, and he said, hey, you know, my life is really hard for doing this. Can someone help me out? Steven, who is a developer, he listened to that. He was like, you know what? I can help you out. So he coded the first version of the animation tool that we currently have. Then Tom, who is another developer, he was like looking at this happening and he liked it. So he went and he stole the concept. He rewrote the code because back then there was no easy way of getting these tools. You had to literally copy paste them into your project. And he ended up writing a few more custom stuff, like he ended up adding some new stuff to it. Then Tauf, also here by the way, who was a UI designer in Tom's project, they were working at Fastlane in the, in the, at the time, fell in love with it. It's, it was super easy to use, it let him do like super cool animations very quickly. And Carl, who was the lead artist, he used to do a lot of pre-visualization on After Effects, and he was surprised that the results were pretty similar very quickly, like it, it didn't take too long to get there. And then I was looking at all of that. My eyes grew big and I was like, yeah, hells yeah, I want that. I want that in my project. And at the time, Steven was working with me. So we just went and we restole the concept from Tom, poached it into the project, and we started using it quite a lot. So I became an advocate for the whole thing. Soon, this thing spread like a virus because we share a lot and we talk about these things in the company quite a lot. Everyone everyone in the company wanted a little piece of this. And I, I do believe that it's because a combination of having empathetic team players who care about each other and want to make each other's life um, easier and creative problem solvers who, you know, they're willing to consider new solutions to old problems, even if the problems have already been solved. There's always a way to optimize and to make your life easier. And then having, you know, passionate advocates, like, I mean, I'm pretty much a cheerleader for this kind of stuff, but you'll have the evangelists and the cheerleaders for this kind of project. But we needed a good starting motivation, right? Like a good project that would be the challenge that would take us there. And I think Fastlane is a really good example of this. Fastlane, um, as a company goal, had to have a really quick turnout. We decided that it, it needed to be really high quality and with a really quick execution. But there's this thing, when we reviewed our previous projects, we were like, uh, you know what, I think the UI is kind of lacking a bit more juice. And that was, that was a thing that they were trying to solve. You know, that means complex animations and transitions, particle effects, chains, sequences, but it needed to be super fast to market. And at the time, this is the tool that we had back then. It was a rough sequencer for the animations. It was presented as a list in which you had to put a bunch of numbers to make things happen. This is coder art because I actually nicked this from a presentation from one of the developers in Fastlane. Um, but you can see that even though this is coder art, it's a super simple, like basic UI, in very quickly, like six minutes later, you can actually have a super cool result with a sequence of animations that trigger particles, and all of these little animations and effects are kind of built in the tool, kind of like how Flash used to do it, right? So this is from Bill Robinson's Creative Engineering Balancing and Juicing with Animations talk. It's available on YouTube. You can go watch it. If you're a developer, I know that there aren't that, that many here, but if you want to watch it, so with a little bit more detail about how this was done back then, this was like two and a half years ago, you should definitely watch it. And this is the result in Fastlane. What happened was Fastlane was developed in 10 months with a team of 15 people. Only two of those people were artists, of which one was a designer. And this became a huge success story for the tool in itself because 
the company saw that because of it, you could experiment more and have more time to do other stuff rather than like trying to make things pretty, you know, because that's just a tiny, tiny bit of the UX, of the, the whole UX process, right? It's just like the final sprinkle of salt. But <clears throat> this was um, massively boosted by the fact that we have sharing as a huge part of our culture. This is what we call a show and tell. It's a huge part of the culture at Space Ape. Every Friday, we convene at the kitchen, we grab a beer, and if we have something to share that we learned that week, or like a new tool that we just did, um, we share it in front of the whole company and we talk about it. This gives us a sense of what Adam called cooperative competition. It's this concept that mixes the competitive aspect of wanting to one-up each other. So like you see something and you go like, yeah, that's super cool, I wanna do better than that. But then you go and you talk to that person, you go, hey, can you tell me how you did this? Can we share the things that you, know, you learned about this? And we always share our learnings. We just needed to actually start sharing our tools. But the thing is, when this process started, it was like the teething process for using any new piece of alpha software. It's hard, man. It's just like everything is really broken. I kept doing things that I wasn't supposed to do. I broke a lot of stuff. I requested constant help, a lot of new features. And, you know, like Tom, who was at the time was kind of like the, the, the stakeholder of the, the, of the tool process, he came through when he wanted. And whenever that happened, it was like Christmas. But, you know, it's still an alpha piece of software. So I think for me, the last one was this, like shared tech is only truly shared when you can share it and other people can use it, you know, not just yourself. More than a couple of projects need to be able to like successfully use it. And more than that, more than a few people need to be able to work on it and contribute to it. Both the setbacks and the solutions and the new learnings should be shared with everyone. And to do that, the tools themselves need to support this kind of contribution. When, you know, when it works, it saves actual lives. Today, this means a culture of a lot of sharing between designers and developers and sometimes, you know, like POs and other types of designers join in and, and request stuff. And we are just like one big team and we don't, we don't feel like there's a us versus them handoff type situation happening we're just like we're in it together and everyone's a part of this right we have a strong sense of communication and early on like i said we were talking about the word juice um we used a platform of show and tell to create like a lot of awareness adam and i did this presentation on basically we're like breaking up with the word juice uh and trying to sub substitute it for a different word so we picked like milkshake Whatever, it was kind of like a jokey thing. The whole point of this was to try and give people more words to use when they're trying to describe what good UI feels like. And like because of this, I ended up becoming the milkshake girl. Like to this day, people still joke about it in my face. Totally worth it though, because it did create awareness and people, it kept this whole idea of sharing tech in people's minds. This was like two years ago, by the way. And at the same time, between the developers, like they started doing things together. We started having jams and sharing this in show and tell as well. But the real kicker for me is having good results to show and actually actioning them to use to get them more momentum, you know, to, to build more stuff. So this is what I'm gonna talk about Gori Supercart, which was a pivotal point in the development of these tools. We had a closed alpha in the Netherlands, and this is kind of what the game looked like back then. And then the team decided that we needed to change the market positioning, which you know impacted the art direc direction and meant changing the visual design of the game overall. We wanted to kind of like make it feel a little bit more mature. This is what it looked like back then.
So after some rounds of brainstorming and defining the new UI look, uh, to be fair, that video is actually kind of like halfway when we were we had already started changing the environment art. This is kind of what we came up with to change the visual design of the whole thing, and we needed to get the builds to this level of quality. It's a remarkable amount of work. Like I've done this before with larger teams. Reskinning an entire game still takes like forever. And you know, the most important part, because the game was still live, we absolutely could not break the build. So the original estimate for me and Steven, this was a team, by the way, doing this. It was me and Steven rescanning the entire game. Uh, I thought it would take about a month to do the whole thing, and Steven thought he would take about two weeks. The actual time it took was this. So it took me half the time than I thought it would. And for Steven, it was even less because to be fair, with the tools in place, he didn't really have to do a lot of bug fixing because it was quite easy for me to change things without breaking stuff because everything was very easy. So this is the final result. So back then, this is this the, the slice of the tools that we had. It's not the entire set, because this was a, a while ago. This is what we had from the suite. And the ways that they helped um, us do this so quickly was with the animation stuff, You know, we could reuse a lot of the animations and change them to match the new visual style very quickly without breaking anything. They also adapt very easily to different screen ratios, which is super important if you're building for mobile, because literally every phone has a different screen resolution. For the button states and the tabs and the toggles, I didn't have to hook up any of that. They were all still working. So it was super easy to bug fix, because there were no bugs around that. Steven created a new tool to add, a, to add blur to the UI, which got, which got folded into the main set of tools. And now a lot of people can use it. The complex toggle states also helped us create complex UI behavior that didn't require his time. So I did it and then just kind of quickly told him what to turn on and off, and that was it. And also create complex chains of animations that kind of already existed. And you can see some of these things kind of, I reused a lot of them. And uh, it, it didn't have an impact, even though the sizes and the proportions were quite different. The like margins around were quite different. Everything was just entirely adapted. And this lent us a lot of credibility because that's what we needed to go off and build more tools and fold them back into the main suite. By showing qu results quickly, we got buy-in from management. We managed to convince them to give us dev time for a one-day jam with like 10 developers. And if everyone is very... Um, you know, worried about losing one day developer time. And we managed to convince everyone that this was important, which led to a huge expansion of the tool set and led to us having this share tech be a part of the skeleton project, which means that every project started as Facehape today is born with all of these tools available. So, you know, they are the path of least resistance. And I think that's the most important thing because people need to use them for, for them to be valuable. But because because they're already there, it's just easy to do it, right? And because anyone can contribute and add new stuff, also easy. But I uh, will just give you a little word, word of caution. Having great tools that allow you to add a lot of good feel type, like polish type stuff to your UI is awesome because it lets you get to really high quality feedback on the polish side very fast. But it can mask bad UX decisions or bad game design decisions, gameplay or bad product decisions, 
because people see the cool stuff and the cool polish and often don't think about the underlying problems. And that's one of the main things about UX, right? There is a right time to push for that level of quality. And when you have all of the tools available, sometimes you think that the right time to push for that is now. You have to contain yourself because probably not. But the right time to push for share tech is yesterday. So as a wrap up, if you are thinking of doing this, these are the four elements that together help create this kind of UX oriented culture where things come from the bottom up instead of from the top down. But one doesn't work without the other. So the right people need the right problems to solve. So you have to have a kick, star a kick ass starting motivation for them, like a, a meaty challenge for them to work on. But if you tackle that, it's kind of pointless if no one hears about it. So you need to have sharing as a deep part of the culture. It needs to be upheld by founders and managers so that people understand that shared knowledge and shared tech is important. But that only makes sense if people can see the results and the tools are being used. So you can take that and use this as momentum to keep building and be in this loop, right? So if you're inspired and you want to try creating, maybe you're in a state, maybe you're in a part of the cycle, maybe you have all of the right people, but you didn't start it yet, or maybe you have started it, but you haven't been able to share it with, with other people. If you're going to try this yourself, brand it, shout it, and share it. Give it a cool name, even though it's going to cause you to become a meme very often, like I did, doesn't matter. Get it in people's heads. Shout about it as often as you can. If you create a sharing platform, just use it as often as you can possibly use and action those, the things you're talking about because that's how you share it, right? Make sure that you document the process, make sure that you talk to the right people. Because this is the ultimate benefit of this kind of culture. If you need to convince anyone that share tech for UI development and to enable good UX is important, just show them this slide. To us, it's literally the most obvious statement ever, but it's good to just remind our ourselves because when you have more time for research and design, it does mean that you have higher quality games that are more accessible, that are more inclusive, and ultimately that's all that we are trying to do, isn't it? So before I go, I just wanna thank a few people. Thank you, Celia, it's an honor to be on the stage. Uh, thank you for the UI team at Space Ape. You guys are awesome, and you helped me so much during this, and we've been we've been through through so much together. But um, more more than that, even the client team at Space Ape is awesome. These guys just literally saved my life and my mental health so many times by listening to me, making my life easier. And yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I'm looking at the questions. There are fun questions in there. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so how would you consider streaming UIs over your own game UI? Do you plan for that? Uh, we are currently working on, do you mean streaming, like actual streaming, like Twitch, right? Streamer Space Camp, yeah, that's what I, that's what I interested. We are working on a game that has uh, a whole bunch of stuff like that planned. Um, we, we are, building tools to let us do that. Um, we don't have them at the moment, but it is, it, is, it is a whole thing, right? Like being able to switch the UI off, being able to move some of the UI elements around. This is something that is being thought out, but we don't have a current solution for that yet. It's a challenge that we're, st we're still tackling. Uh, are there questions in here? I want to catch the mic. Yes, so the question. Oh. Wait for the mic. Okay, so about motivating people. Uh, in, the, in a team you have different profiles and some of them are introverts and they don't like to be together with the team and in an activity like you have to, sh to share publicly uh, what to learn, they don't feel comfortable. So h how did your, your team deal with this? Uh, how you created this culture where they will share and uh, be okay with that and everything? Um, that happens a lot, like, people are different and that's okay. What you need is to, those people, for, for those people to feel comfortable sharing within a smaller team, which is what we have, so we have a little guild of like, 
the UI team and the developers team. So when you're in a room with just like, you know, 10, 15 people, sometimes it's easier. And then having people that become evangelists for them. So they become the advocates. That's kind of what I did. I kind of like adopted the rest of the team because I, I'm loud, you know, I'm tropical. I just, I, I, I use my hands a lot. And so I don't feel, I don't feel as scared of, I'm not such an introvert and then I can speak for them and then show the, the company the cool things that they're working on and they feel comfortable not having to stand on a stage. So it is a collaboration, just find the right people to kind of like help each other out, you know. And that's kind of how it would happen for us. Just, a, just a, one more question about this. Uh, is it in the time of the work time or after work time when you meet together? So because some, some of this was done in what we call magic time, so kind of like downtime between tasks if you don't have something that you're working on at the moment. Some, sometimes Tom particularly stayed late because he wanted to do something, but eventually because we went into this loop of like sharing and showing people that it was important, it became official. So it transitioned. We didn't stay in the unofficial time for much, for, for too long. Thanks. Right. Uh, so sorry, we can't take any more questions, but we're having a break right now, so feel free to uh, come talk to Lisa. Thank you so much. Let's have a coffee break. And uh, yeah. <laughs>